started here. Let's just pray before we get started uh, with worship here. Thank you, Father, that we can all be here together and glorify and worship your name. We just pray that you uh, you be here and that we can just sit in your presence this morning. Amen. Amen.
feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. Oh, there's no 
Would your word be exemplified 
uh, by our feet and by our hands as we go and do uh, what it is you call us to do. We thank you for this time together in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Y'all can be seated. Welcome, welcome. If I didn't get a chance to meet you this morning, my name is Matt, and uh, the six-letter word they call me here is the pastor, and so it is an honor to be here with you this morning and uh, to be able to go into this, uh, the word of God today. Um, first off, happy Mother's Day. Yeah, it's mate. It's, it's the batteries. No. <laughs> Mic check. Yeah, re- Check, check. Yeah, Reese in my office, the batteries will be on the floor. Uh, they might be. Who knows? We totally talked about this like 30 seconds before the service. We're like, hey, we should check the batteries and test your mic. <laughs> Every woman in the audience is like, this is such a typical male thing. Positive goes to positive, negative to negative. <laughs> Two wrongs don't make gold right, but when you're using electrical, they do. Let's see this. Watch this. We've got the power now. Check. Yes. Okay, nailed it. Woo! My wife married a special man. He knows how to change batteries. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day. Let's start that over again. A joyous day to celebrate that uh, each and every one of us are here because of a mom, and that's pretty awesome. And so, uh, make sure to make sure to make your mom feel special today, um, in whatever capacities you are capable of. And uh, we're gonna we're gonna hand out some flowers after the service to all the ladies in the room. We're gonna get, but uh, um, we're gonna get the cute kids to do it. So we're going to get the kids up after the service, and they're going to hand out flowers to all the ladies. So that would be fun. Um, but today, we are looking into, we're going to continue in our sermon series, looking yeah. at Matthew chapter 7. And we're going uh, through uh, 24 uh, through 27. And this is the ending, this is the cap piece of our Sermon on the Mount, which we have been, um, I'm not going to use the word stuck, but have been going through uh, basically since the middle of January. We've taken it piece by piece, we've glanced over some, we've combined others, and today we are finishing the Sermon on the Mount and we will be jumping into uh, the active ministry of miracles and traveling that Jesus did um, as he traveled around uh, Jerusalem, Judea, uh, and, and, uh, and the surrounding region of Judea. And Did I say Judea twice? It's fine. And so this sermon is, topic, is titled The Firm Foundation. And it is centered around this idea that Christ is our cornerstone. We're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 7, uh, verses 24 through 27. Um, and we will also be looking at a couple of verses in Ephesians, uh, referencing 1 Corinthians, and referencing basically the entire book of Nehemiah um, as well in this morning's service. And so uh, what we're looking at today is a culture and a people that aligns itself with the cornerstone of life, which the Bible tells us is Jesus. Um, do we have any construction or handy renovation people in the room? You can toss up your hand. I'm putting it up by example, not that I'm handy or construction based. I have learned out of necessity to, uh, to do some things. But um, I've not done a whole lot of foundational construction work in my 11 years of being married. Um, and, but I have gotten to do a little bit of foundational construction work. And it really helped me understand what was meant by Jesus being the cornerstone. And so this morning, I'm going to interchange a couple of words. We're going to be talking about what it means to build our house based on the cornerstone. That house being our spiritual lives or the lives in which we live. And so sometimes I'll use the word lives, sometimes I'll use the word house. Um, and it's just to indicate that there is a foundation being laid each and every day, we call this formation, um, that is being laid in alignment with the cornerstone or in disalignment with the cornerstone. What is the cornerstone? 
Well, a few years ago, I had the opportunity to put in a retaining um, brick wall with my father-in-law, who does a lot of foundational work. And, uh, and we were out there, and I, him and I, we have some different perspectives on construction. He is perfectionist and knowledgeable. I am speedy and get it done. Um, and you can tell which one is probably more valuable when doing foundational work. I am great at painting really fast and then needing to repaint really fast a second time because it wasn't great the first time. And so as we are excavating and digging, we had all these blocks and we began to lay them in the ground. And each one, we'd have to put it down and we'd take up this little level and we'd level it this way and that way and angle and angle. And if it wasn't perfectly level, we'd pick it up and we'd put down some more uh, fill and we'd take out some here and we'd put it down. And one block could take 15, 20 minutes to lay depending on how much work was required. And then after we laid our first row, my father-in-law went in and covered it over all the face of the rock that we had just laid. I was like, what was the point? Why did we spend so much time working on this first block and this first row if you were just gonna cover it all up so we can't even see what we've done? And it is because that first block we laid, it sets the tone for the entire project. And every block we laid after that was based on its correct placement off of where that block was. Each time a new block was laid, we had to line it up with the cornerstone block and go, okay, we are in alignment. Because if we had done it my way, just quick, fast, and easy, that wall would not have lasted very long. It would have fallen over, and it wouldn't have been aligned to anything, and it would have been a disaster. And so today, as we study these scriptures, we want to understand that the scriptures declare in Isaiah chapter 8 and in, in 1 Peter, uh, Peter talks about it as well, that Jesus is the cornerstone of our lives. And that we build this foundation in alignment with the cornerstone. Each and every day we are alive, we are adding to the foundation of the spiritual house that we live in. It is called formation. We are either being formed in the image of God or we are being deformed uh, by that which is not God. And so there is some foundational work that needs to happen in our lives, some foundational assessment. Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, says that you, if you have accepted uh, Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and asked the Holy Spirit to reside in you, are a living temple of the Lord God. The living temple. Your being, your, your spiritual life, is the house of God. Take a moment and consider the ramifications of what that means. Sometimes I'm like, Jesus, I don't think you want to be home right now. We are the living temples of the Lord our God. Let us read the, the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 7. If you have your Bibles with you, you can turn to Matthew 7, verse 24 through 27. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose up, the wind blew and beat against the house, and it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But anyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash." These are the cap words of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. He's just done a three-chapter discord of what it looks like to, to live in harmony, in alignment with God. And then he says this right at the end. Hey, if you've heard all these things and you don't put them into practice, why were you here? It's not going to go well. There's going to be wind and rain and waters and floods that beat against this house. 
Jesus doesn't shy away from the fact that life has its challenges. And that hearing the words of Jesus is not the solution. It is applying the words of Jesus to our lives, which enables us to be firmly rooted upon the rock. If, I had, if my father-in-law had simply told me how to lay the cornerstone and then let me go and do it myself, who knows? I would not have listened very well to what he said. I would have been like, all right, sure. I'll take 35 minutes to lay the first block. Not happening. I can do it way faster. Watch me. Time me. I can do this. But he came alongside me and he showed me how. And that is exactly what we see Jesus do. Is he not only speaks the word of teaching, he not only teaches the mind, but he brings healing to the hearts and applications to our hands. He teaches our mind, he heals our hearts, and he gives us application in our hands. And he says, let us build our, our house, our lives, on the firm foundation. Since the moment you've been born, you were laying a foundation, erecting walls, putting up a roof, furnishing your spiritual house, your, your physical life with Things. Some of those things have been uh, in direct alignment with, the, with this cornerstone. Some have been uh, structural work that has been uh, very good. Some of the furnishings within our house that, we, that we've accepted might not be as useful in our, in our house as we might think. Sometimes we can be exceedingly intentional and specific with the things we place in our lives. And other times, it's like we went to the most traumatic secondhand store you could ever think of, and we furnished our house with that. When we read through the scriptures, we see that God encourages us, and we see this, especially in Psalm 51, which is the verse I'm going to quote. It says, search in me and create in me a clean heart, O God. Come into my house. Come into my life. And would you identify the things that I've just placed here to clutter up and make my life look full and help me to remove them? Help me take the things I've picked up, the baggage, the garbage I've picked up and put in and began to believe and live my life in a particular way. And help me to throw that garbage out that I might walk in your commands and your precepts and that I might walk in a place of health and structure. There's a book I recently read. It was called Live No Lies. But what a provocative title. It's a pretty intense book. To live no lies. And the essence of the book was allow God to examine your foundation and the things that you have rooted and established in your life so that you might not live based off of false pretenses. How do we combat this? Well, we have to be willing to allow God to examine our hearts, our minds, and be the director of our hands and feet. The word would declare that we are his hands and feet extended to those around us. My wife has been asking for a bathroom right now for the last couple of years. I don't know, we've been married 11 years, about that long. And uh, this is the year, this is the summer we're doing the bathroom right now. It's happening this year, I've said it publicly, it's on Facebook Live, and so now we know it's actually happening. There's a lot of work in doing a renovation, especially in a 1979 mobile home that doesn't have a bathroom fan. And if you know how condensation and mold work, you can imagine what I'm gonna find when I open up the walls. That's part of the reason I haven't opened up the walls is because the minute you begin to kind of tear some of that stuff down, it gets really scary and overwhelming really fast. You like, you take a one piece of wallboard, or in my case, punched a hole through a piece of wallboard, and I'm like, oh, that looks like black mold. I don't know if I want to keep going on this. I'm thinking to myself, okay, we're going to change out the top shower unit. We're going to need some new PEX lines under the house, so I have to do it during summer so I can get under my house. But then I'm going to be without hot water. What's the fastest way to get water back for my family? There's all these things that you need to think about, isn't there? And sometimes... When we receive a revelation from the Lord, we think about the long-standing ramifications of what that might affect, and we go, I'm a little overwhelmed with the application of that to my life, and so I'm just going to set it aside for a while. 
We go, hey, God, search the foundation of my house. And he's like, you got some fault lines and cracks in this foundation. And it's going to take some significant effort uh, and structure to bring this back into fulfillment. And he's like, but don't worry. You can do all things with me. And I'm here and with you to the ends of the ages. And we're like, yeah, I just don't really want to open up that project right now. If you could just leave that area of my heart alone for a little bit, come back to it in a year. Maybe I'll be more ready then. But the reality is, is that our God is a master builder and he wants to renovate and do an incredible instruction, construction in our lives to see our lives in a place of health according to the spiritual temple that we are. Redoing foundational work is hard. It's not simple. But we need to remember that God is with us. That he is for us and not against us. And when he brings a revelation to us on something that needs to shift, we call it a conviction or a correction. And according to 2 Timothy, all, the entire word of God is God-breathed for the purpose of correction and conviction. It's not for shame. It's for healing. Then we go, okay, this work that's presently being done, it hurts and it's hard. And I'm not sure how to continue on, but Lord, I'm going to trust in your blueprint and in your plan. If you bought anything from Ikea, you understand the value of a blueprint and a plan. Because it makes no sense if you don't look at that instruction book. And every man in this room who's, who's married knows you tried to build it, and 35 minutes later, after you lost your salvation nine times, and you've hit yourself with eight hammers, your wife gently came over and was like, hey, would you like the instruction book now? And you're like, oh, okay, fine. I will use the instruction book. There is a guideline and a blueprint formulated for you and me, right here. A nice little acronym in the Bible, your basic instructions before leaving earth. Found right there. I want us to switch to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18 through 22. And I love this verse. This verse was a godsend. I was praying, and I was reading, and... This verse just literally jumped off the pages to me as I was reading. It says, for through him, that being Jesus, we both have, or we all have, access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God and also members of his household. You are members of his church. You are members of his temple built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. What a powerful, packed set of verses. Let's break this down. You have the Spirit of God living in you, that you have direct access to God, no longer a stranger, but because of Jesus, you are now considered a citizen of God's kingdom, a member of his household, built, and I love this, this was so great, as I read this, it was like this epiphany moment for me. We've talked about how Jesus is the cornerstone of our faith. The cornerstone of our life. But watch what Paul says the foundation is laid with. The apostles, which is translated saints, which is in layman's term, those who are believers, and the prophets, which is indicated to be the word of God. So we have this cornerstone, which is Jesus, and everything has to line up perfectly square to, where, to how Jesus is aligned. But the foundation is is poured, is made possible, and is held in perfect alignment because of the saints around you and the word of God before you. And I thought, Lord, this is so good because we need each other in the laying of the foundation. It is ridiculously difficult to lay a foundation by yourself. You gotta have eight set of eyes to look back this way and that way and that way and up and down and try to lay the foundation and pour the cement. It doesn't function well. But when we have others with us, the saints alongside us, laying that foundation together, 
with Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. We're not laid um, a foundation apart from Jesus. It is an alignment with him. Then we see the foundation is built with the help of the saints by the direction of the word according to the cornerstone of Jesus. And I thought, that is so cool. A few weeks ago, I got to help a friend do some renovation work on his foundation. We had this giant 10 inch, 12 inch, 14 inch, I don't even know, it was a huge cement saw. And it was like, if you've ever used a skill saw, it times it by 12,000 and that's what this thing was. Like you would press the button and like the RPMs just threw you all over. And we're trying to like cement, cut through this cement wall. And what was so cool is that as I'm on this, this skill saw, the cement skill saw, it is heavy and I'm shaking and all the photos, I'm just like, oh my gosh, what's going on with my life? And there's also a video of it. And as I was there, as I'm cutting along, I have out of the peripheral vision, my buddy whose house we're now cutting into, like he has trusted me to cut his house. And he's telling me, lift the saw, level the saw this way, you gotta go a little faster, you gotta come back this way. He was giving me assistance as we're laying and working on this foundational renovation of his house. And you know what? There was one time where he was like grabbing some water or something and I thought I was cool enough to run the saw by myself. And I looked at the line and my line went like this. Instead of straight, it was like Like it was all over the place. It was a disaster. And I was like, I needed him there, and subsequently he needed me there to be able to hold us level, steady, and true, so that our cuts lined up on each side of the wall so we could push out this block of cement, which weighed a cool 2,000 pounds. We did not push it. It was heavy. <laughs> but I needed him, and he needed me. Friends, you need one another. We are better together when it comes to building the church. This, listen to this. In him, the whole building, this is the house of God. This is the temple of the Lord. This is the church. The whole building, and by building, he is indicating the spiritual building of our lives. This is not a physical building Paul is talking about. Is joined together and rises to become a holy temple. Individually, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, we are temples of the living God. When we come together, working together, working alongside each other to lay this firm foundation on the cornerstone of Jesus, a holy temple rises. For those who might be um, used to church words, this would be the big C church. When we come together, and we see the workings of God for the benefit and the upbuilding and the strengthening of each other. Peter claims, as he quotes Isaiah chapter 8, verse 14, he says that those who lay their foundation on the cornerstone will not be shaken and will not be put to shame. But Isaiah also says that that cornerstone is a stumbling block for those who reject or do not understand the value of having the cornerstone. It becomes a stumbling block, right? You're building your project and you're like, if it wasn't for that, that silly first stud I put in, this whole project would have went better. No, that silly first stud was your cornerstone and you just didn't align the rest of your project off that piece. We have some renovation work to do, friends and some careful building to do as well. I wanna, I wanna consider the, the book of Nehemiah. For a quick overview, Nehemiah served a foreign dignitary called Artaxerxes. If you've watched 300, you'll get the idea. He, said, he goes back to Jerusalem with this call on God's, uh, by God on his life to be the physical militant leader and overseer, general, governor of Jerusalem, and alongside him is a gentleman named Ezra, who was the priest, uh, the spiritual leader of the community of Israel at that time. Nehemiah goes back to Jerusalem. He has permission from Artaxerxes. He supplied the products needed to rebuild Jerusalem by Artaxerxes, and he gets there, and he, his immediate reaction is to weep. 
And then his second action is he gets on a horse in, at dusk time when the people don't really see what he's doing and he goes out and he tours along the collapsed and fallen wall house of Jerusalem. And he cries because of the state, the spiritual and physical state of the nation at the time. And he asks God for help to build this wall, to build a firm foundation that can be established in the culture of Jesus. And the directions that are given to him that he then explains to the people of Israel are this. Each one of you, this is a huge project, but we cannot do it alone. So I want each one of you to work on the section of wall in front of your own house. Right? And so everyone's like, all right, I can't do the whole project, but I can do this little section in front of my house. And so pe people begin to build the wall together. And as I'm building my wall, it, it butts up and connects with the person beside me on this side and my neighbor on that side. And all of a sudden, as we're building this wall together, it's not just a wall that can be pushed over because it's in isolation. It's built in community and strengthened because of that. This is the exact same thing that Paul writes about in Ephesians, is that it is established on the saints and the prophets, with Jesus being the cornerstone, that we would do it together. Given spiritual gifts, physical talents, natural abilities, to be able to come alongside each other, to disciple and strive towards Jesus, to encourage people to follow after Jesus in all things. The reality, friends, is... When we do this efficiently and effectively, when we lay down our prides and we allow the Spirit of God to indicate and teach us not only where we need some renovational work, but where we can come alongside and help hold someone's hand and walk a journey of renovation with them as well, that we begin to see this culture that is set on the cornerstone of Jesus. Not set in individual temples, but in the coming together and the rising of the holy temple of God. The all-sufficient cornerstone, Jesus, the one who has victory over sin and death, the one who has established an escape uh, uh, from temptation and sin, our lighthouse, our rock, and our salvation. This culture works towards a common goal of maturity in Jesus and expansion of his kingdom. As we see spiritual houses built on the firm foundation of the word of God, discipleship by the saints, and the cornerstone of Christ. We need community for health. We need each other. We need communities of believers to encourage us, to guide us, to remind us of the value of the work that we're doing. Man, when I'm in the midst, knee-deep in black mold, trying to renovate my bathroom this summer, I hope I have a friend there that's like, you got this. Just keep going. Don't breathe. Here, use this mask. We need some friends to come alongside us and encourage us when things get tough. It's easy to start a renovation and never finish it because you just, you're like, I, I don't know. You need some people around you. Ask the Lord to bring people around you. Also ask God to place you around people. God has placed us in this community with various gifts, various gifts and skill sets to be able to work together to build this holy temple spoken about in Ephesians chapter 2. So that when the wind, when the waves, when the streams and the rain come, we are held together. I don't know if this was a game when you guys were all in school, out in the play field, Red Rover. Some nods. Red Rover, basically you just linked arms with each other, and then, or hands, and then you just yelled people's names, and they would run full bore from across the field and try to break through your hands. I have no idea why teachers allowed us to play this game. Or how we didn't break wrists, like every single time we played it. <laughs> Man, if someone ran at me right now, I guarantee you my arm would move. But when I held onto someone's hand, and we were ready for it, no one broke through. That's the image that Jesus gives us here. 
That's the image that Paul lays forth, and that's the image that Nehemiah worked towards, that we would be arm in arm, hand in hand, shoulder to shoulder, an impenetrable wall of God's house. See, the cool thing about this house is the walls are painted in poems of grace. We see that Jesus, or God declares in the Psalms that he is singing over you. Singing over you. As beautiful as our worship team's voices sound, imagine the voice of God singing over you. The walls of your house are painted in poems of grace. The house is furnished not haphazardly from secondhand stores of trauma, but through love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, self-control, patience, whatever other fruits of the Spirit I didn't say. The silverware found in this house, silverware of hospitality and fellowship. It's coming alongside. Hey, let us sup together. Let us spend time with one another. Let us work together as we pursue the building of this wall, the formation of it. Friends, we're gonna, we're gonna, I'm gonna end that there. I'm gonna challenge you this week. Two things. A, would you be bold enough? No, I'm gonna challenge you with three things, sorry. Firstly, would you acknowledge Jesus as the cornerstone of your life? And maybe that's an acknowledgement of, Lord, you haven't been, but I want you to be. Or maybe that's an, an acknowledgement of, Lord, you are, but I just haven't really followed along with it. I want to challenge you this week, even today, in this moment. Is Jesus your cornerstone? And will he be? Secondly, I want to challenge you to ask the Lord to search your heart. To expose the cracks in your foundation and the furnishings of your house that need to be removed so that his spirit might fill it and it might be a house that overflows with the joy of the Lord. And thirdly, I want you to ask the Lord whom you can walk alongside as they're in the midst of spiritual renovation by the direction of the Lord. To whom will you be an apostle who helps lay the foundation of an understanding of the prophets, the word of God, and the establishment of the cornerstone of Jesus in someone's life? I want to challenge you with those three things today. I want to bless you in them. Father God, I bless those who are listening to this message, who are joining in in this worship. Father, I ask that you would firmly root and establish your word and your presence, your purposes upon their hearts. That, Lord, that you would be at the forefront of teaching their minds, healing their hearts, and activating their hands. Lord, I bless them in their conversations this week in their goings and their comings, that, Lord, that they would be filled with your presence. We thank you for this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Church, we're going to have another time of worship here, another song, and then afterwards we're going to uh, speak a blessing over uh, the mothers and ladies and hand out the, uh, the, the flowers. Um, and so why don't we stand and join us for a song of worship.
Amen. Church, we're going to have some worship music on in the background here. Uh, feel free to come on up for prayer this morning, and otherwise you are dismissed uh, to spend some time together in fellowship. God bless, and thanks for joining us.